Welcome to the session on number theory and computer science. Um, our first speaker uh, this session is Mina Rayume. Yeah. <laughs> um, a, uh, a student of, of collaboration with Dr. Uta Zeigler. And she's talking about implementing and comparing various dots and boxes, Monte Carlo tree search techniques. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so just as a brief overview of what I'm going to be going over today, I'll first talk about kind of a background on what dots and boxes is, just in case some of you aren't familiar with it. I'll then talk about the Monte Carlo tree search or MCTS algorithm and the different steps that are involved. And finally, I'll talk about my specific modification and the research that I work on called next node selection or NNS selection. So going into the dots and boxes game, this is kind of what a small board looks like. So it's just filled with a lot of dots and two players take turns placing an edges into the board until the entire board is filled. So dots and boxes is a zero sum game, meaning that there are a fixed number of total points. So in a dots and boxes game, the number of the way to score a point is to place the fourth edge in a box and then that player kind of takes the box and scores a point. So for a two by two board, there are four total points that can be uh, scored. And there is also this go again factor for the dots and box boxes game. So in figure eight, for example, you can see that the blue player places in this fourth edge and kind of takes this box and then they're able to place in or they are forced to place in this edge right here. And so this go again factor kind of causes a lot of difficulty when trying to approximate what the next best action is in terms of optimal play. So I wanted to include this slide just to give you some context on why this game is pretty computationally complex, as well as why there's a lot of strategy involved. So in this example, I have N is the height is of the board. So in this case, it's two. And then M is the width of the board. Again, it's two. And in order to find the number of edges, you just follow this formula right here. And so for a two by two board, we have 12 edges. And for a five by five board, we have 60 edges. And while that might not seem like that huge of a difference, when you look at the unscored states, which are the board configurations disregarding which player placed on which edge or which player kind of scored which point, the number of states drastically increases from a two by two to a five by five board. So you can see we go from 4,096 states to 12 times 10 to the 18th states. And then when we look at the move sequences, you can see this, this change is even more drastic as we go from 4.8 times 10 to the eighth power uh, move sequences to 8.3 times 10 to the 81st power. And so although a five by five board might not seem like it's that big of a board to all of you, um, as you can see here, it is actually quite time and computationally complex. And so this is where a lot of the difficulty comes in uh, when analyzing these boards. So going straight into the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, as opposed to using the brute force method of looking at all possible board configurations and their actions, MCTS uses previously collected statistical data to kind of deem what is important to the game and what's important to the player's learning. And it more deeply looks at those different uh, sections of the game tree. So MCTS is often visualized as the game tree, as you can see right here, where these circles are called nodes and those are just board configurations. And then these links collect, uh, linking kind of the different nodes are the different actions that can be taken to go from one board configuration to the other. So MCTS is an algorithm that's often used for games with very large move spaces that can't be searched using the brute force method. And as you could see on the last slide, this quickly becomes the case as the board size increases. And MCTS is also used for games where a lot of the strategy comes in the earlier parts of the game. So these are the four steps to the MCTS algorithm. So we first start with selection and that's where um, the algorithm kind of uses different formulas I'm going to be talking about later on in these slides. And in order to kind of approximate what the next best move is to take. And so you can see here, it kind of uses the formula to determine what action, what path it wants to take down the game tree. And so during selection, that's also where what's called a bias term comes into play. So the bias term is the balance between exploration and exploitation, where exploration is looking at new nodes that aren't yet in the game tree, as opposed to exploitation, which looks at nodes that are already in the tree and looks at them more deeply. 
So then we go on to step two and that's called expansion. So that's where based off of possible actions that can be taken from the current board configuration right here, new nodes are then added to the game tree. Then we go to step three and that's simulation where edges are randomly placed into the board from this current board configuration. And until we reach the terminal state where all of the edges are filled up. And that's where we can determine if it ends up it for as a win, loss, or a draw for that certain player. So a win corresponds to a one value, a loss is negative one, and a draw is zero. And this value is then back propagated all the way up the, the same path that it took to get down there uh, during the back propagation step. And so during back propagation, the qualities of these actions and nodes are essentially updated. So the quality is the net rewards, which can be found by taking the net sum of all of these win, loss, and draw values from previously uh, simul from previous simulations. And we take that value divided by the number of times those nodes or those actions were looked at. And so that's the quality value. And then these four steps are then kind of repeated thousands or even millions of times in order to kind of get a better estimate on what's closer to optimal play. So obviously the more times that these steps are repeated, uh, the better that the player will uh, learn, but it's also a lot more time consuming, especially for larger board sizes, if we're, if we're trying to repeat it several million of times. So as kind of a summary, the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm is kind of like the thinking process. So once the number of simulations is up, then it kind of outputs the action that it kind of approximates to be the best move to take from that point. So going into my specific research called next node selection, this deals with the first step of the uh, MCTS algorithm, which is the selection process. And it also looks at transpositions and transpositions are actually very common in a lot of games. So transpositions can be are nodes that can be reached through multiple paths in the game tree. So for example, right here, if we were to start from the root node, take action A first and then action B, this resulting board configuration will be the same as if we were to take action B first and then action A. And so that would make this green child node here a transposition. So what has been previously implemented is called current action selection. And that's where the qualities of these uh, actions right here on the links is used for the selection calculations. But what I implemented is next node selection where the qualities of these nodes are instead used for selection calculations. So the idea behind next node selection is that more information is going to be known at these children nodes here, as opposed to these actions, because multiple paths in the game tree can affect the different values and the quality of these children nodes. So these are the two different formulas uh, so that you can kind of compare the differences between next node selection and current action selection. So looking at next node selection, the Q is the quality uh, of that node. And I mentioned this before, but again, it's right here for the formula. So that's the net reward divided by the number of times chosen. And this S prime kind of represents the child node. So as you can see here, if we were at the current node, the S prime is the child node right here. And that quality value is added to the bias term that I mentioned earlier. And this value is calculated for all of the children nodes. So it would be calculated for these two nodes then the maximum of those values would be found. So let's say this was the maximum, then that would be the choice of selection. And then you can see that the only difference between next node selection and current action selection is this right here. So that's the S comma A. So that represents the current action or the current nodes action. So that would be this action right here. So the quality of this would be used as opposed to the quality right here. So just to give you a little more of a concrete example on the difference between uh, NNS and CAS selection, I have this example. So if we look at N S of A, that just represents the number of times an action was selected. R S of A represents the net rewards of an action. And then Q S of A, again, is a quality using that formula. And then the, just the R, N, and Q are the same things, but for a node instead of an action. So I realize that there's a lot of numbers here, but I want you to focus on the numbers that are highlighted. So if we look at current action selection first, what the algorithm would do is it would compare these three uh, values that are highlighted in red and find the maximum. So obviously out of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and 0 0.36, 0 0.5 would be the value that is chosen for selection. So this it would kind of go down this path uh, for that round of selection. 
And then this differs from not next node selection because next node selection looks at these three different values. And you can see that if the node is in a transposition, so you, for example, this node and this node right here, the action and the node's quality values are exactly the same. But when there's a transposition, like this green node right here, uh, where different node paths can affect a, the values here, this value isn't going to be the same as the action. And so this kind of represents that more information is known at this child node. So for, for next node selection, it would actually choose this path as opposed to this path that was chosen by current action selection. So I hope that this diagram kind of helps to clarify uh, the differences between next node selection and current ac action selection and kind of helps to show that more information is known at the node as opposed to the action here. So in order to kind of test to see if NNS is actually better than CAS as it should be, I created what I call the coordinator framework. And the coordinator essentially passes information from player one to player two and vice versa. Uh, so for example, if player one was to go first, they would go through the MCTS algorithm and output whatever action it wants to take. It would then pass that information to the coordinator and the coordinator would tell player two what action player one wanted to take. And then from there, depending on whether or not player one scored a point, the co coordinator would figure out who should go next and then ask that player for whatever action they wanna take. So the coordinator framework essentially allows me to test players of two completely different selection types and have them play directly against one another. So that results in four different player combinations. So CAS versus CAS, NNS versus CAS, CAS versus NNS, and then NNS and NNS. And that allows you to just kind of see how they compare depending on whether they're a player one or a player two. So I've been actually doing a lot of testing over the past couple of weeks, but just for simplicity's sake, this is the only data that I'm going to show today. So what I did was for a two by two board, um, just as some background, all of the information is from the viewpoint of player one. So for a two by two board, player one should win an optimal play. So that this means that the higher the win ratio and the closer it is to one, the better it is and the more closely it plays to optimal play. So what I did was I ran 10 matches and 10 different tests for each of the different run configurations. And I ran that for all of these different simulations of players. So from 5,000 simulations all the way up to 150,000 simulations. And I ran that for what the original code had for current action selection, which is shown in orange right here. And then I also ran the same thing using the coordinator framework, but this time I ran an NNS player against an NNS player. And so that results are shown here in green. So the first thing that I want you to see is there's this huge dip from a 20,000 to 50,000 simulations. And so that kind of indicates that the player, although it was very close to optimal play right here and it was winning a lot, it still wasn't learning kind of what it should have been. So after 50,000 simulations, up, um, up until 150,000, it actually kind of learns that in optimal play, the first player should choose an edge on the outside of the board as opposed to kind of the cross on the inside for a two by two board. And it just so happens that the player one learns that after 150,000 simulations. So I actually ran these tests for a two by two all the way up to a five by five board, as well as the four different player combinations that I mentioned earlier. Um, but I kind of realized that a lot of the simulations weren't enough in order to find anything that was somewhat conclusive, especially for larger board sizes, which need a lot more uh, simulations. So that's what I'm hoping to do in the near future. So I would like to take the time to quickly acknowledge Dr. Ziegler, who is such a wonderful research mentor, as well as Jared Prince, who's the original author of our MCTS Dots and Boxes code. And thank you all so much for listening to my presentation today. Are, does anyone have any questions that I can hopefully answer? Any questions? I mean, so it's it's learn, so it's kind of learning is. Yeah. 
I guess, I guess the thing that I was a little, um, there's some, there must be some changes going on, right. As it goes, because, because that big, that big dip that was in there like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, can you explain, I, maybe I just missed that part of what was happening. Yeah, sure. So if we go back here, um, so these are the number of simulations and the number of times those four steps of the algorithm are essentially repeated. So the more times that those steps are repeated, the more statistical data is going to be collected on how many times a certain action leads to a win. And so what happens here is that although 20,000 simulations seems like it's learning just the perfect amount to be close to optimal play, it's actually not necessarily learning the correct information because it hasn't done the re repetitions enough times to really become close to optimal play. Okay, thank you. I mean, thank you for your question. Do you have any results on, uh, on larger boards? So I did collect all the way up to a five by five board, um, but looking at the data, I wasn't really able to find anything conclusive. And I believe that's just because I only ran up to 150,000 simulations, like for a two by two. And I don't believe that that's enough simulations in order to say anything conclusive for a five by five board. So I'm hoping to do a lot more tests with a lot larger simulations, perhaps um, maybe about a million simulations in order to get more uh, accurate results. Could you, could you use your results to improve strategy of playing the game? Like you're saying that the, it, through statistical things, is you look at this, this strategy seems to work better. Um, is, you know, if, if later on, for example, on a bigger board, you get some of these big drops like that and say it learns a new strategy. Um, I mean, is it possible to, to use that? To kind of, you know, like for example, now you know that this is a good strategy for optimal play. Yeah, so I, I would say it's definitely possible to do that. But what my research was more focusing on was comparing these two different types of selection as mm -hmm. opposed to kind of looking for new strategies. Okay, interesting. I'm just curious, um, how long does it take on the two by two to, to run say 20,000 simulations versus the like five by five um, running 20,000 simulations? I mean, does that take a, a long time for to do and, and what software package are you using? Yeah, sure. So what I kind of initially was using um, was just running single uh, run configurations on Eclipse, but I realized that that was kind of slow because after one running one time, you would have to kind of manually rerun things. And so my mentor, Dr. Ziegler, she showed me how to use a cluster and kind of like a virtual uh, desktop where I would be able to run like 10 or a couple hundred tests at the exact same time so they would run in parallel so that really cut down the runtime a lot um i would say for the first part of your question twenty thousand simulations for two, two by two is fairly short it probably runs in uh, a couple minutes maybe less than a minute um so it's almost instantaneous but for a five by five it does take several hours so for twenty thousand 20,000 probably only takes like 40 minutes, but going up to 150,000 simulations, it took me probably about three to four hours. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, let me give you, uh, let me give you an introduction. Okay, this is interesting. This is a finance and omni finance honoring Professor Dr. George Cantor's legacy, and the this will be work of uh, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, uh, Ryan Mazzoni, uh, K. T. Thompson, and Dr. Shane Matthew Palmquist. That's right. All right. All right. Um, again, um, just as he introduced me, I'm Brian Mazzoni, and again, this is finites omni finites honoring Professor George Cantor's legacy. And again, adapted from the work of myself, Tate Thompson and Dr. Shane Palmquist. So who is George Cantor? Um, he's a German mathematician born in St. Petersburg, Russia in 1845. And he actually died in 1918. And he founded one of the most influential mathematical theories of the past 150 years. And this is number theory. Um, and he introduced an important concept of transfinite numbers. So what is his number theory? Also referred to as set theory in many cases. Um, what was developed in a series of letters to his colleague, Professor Richard Deacon, and it basically states that if a number, if a collection of numbers A were to be stated as equal to another collection of numbers B, 
every number in A must correspond or be paired with the number in B and vice versa. And basically it means that they have to, in order to be equal, they have to be bijectical, which, bijectical, which means having one-to-one -one correspondence. So uh, with this in mind, he actually has a very famous example, in some cases notorious. And with set theory in mind, he compared the set of all natural numbers to the set of all rational numbers. Um, there are an infinite number of natural numbers, yet there are even more rational numbers than natural ones. And just to clarify, natural numbers are like whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Sometimes zero is considered a natural number. Natural number, And rational numbers are basically um, fractions. And so he's actually show, he was able to show that there's a bijection between these two sets. Um, he actually did this. Um, you can see many examples online where you can theoretically list out every rational number, like one over one, one over two, one over three, all the way continuous. Um, two over one, two over two, two over three, two over four, three over one, three over two. And you could theoretically list every fraction there is. And so theoretically, then you can point to every single number and uh, assign a natural number to it. So one, two, three, four, five, you can do this forever. Um, so basically that means there is bijection between these sets, um, which means they have equal cardinality, which again is the number of elements in a set. So he extended this concept by examining other large infinite sets of numbers, such as real numbers. And he basically went on to show that real numbers is not countable meaning a bijection between natural numbers and real numbers is not possible, which in a way proves different sides infinities. But how is he able to do this? With this famous diagonal argument. So I think it's best understood if one considers a set of infinite sequence of binary exclusive numbers. So S of N, we'll call these right here, it's just an enumeration of zeros and ones. It can be anything, any pattern, um, completely made up. But there's always gonna be a sequence of binary numbers we'll call S, which does not correspond to any row S of N. Um, you can get S by just flipping every number in a diagonal row to its complementary value, um, where zeros becomes ones and ones become zeros. As long as one digit in each row and at most one digit in each column is chosen, the digit can be changed to get a value that is not on the table. Um, you often see this example with every decimal between zero and one. Um, no matter how many decimals you list out, you're not going to be able to list them all. It's uncountable. But what does this mean? Um, the point of this exercise is basically proof by contradiction. Um, again, it's uncountable. Uh, the diagonal argument can be made for any set of real numbers. There will always be missing values in any set of real numbers. Therefore, the cardinality of all natural numbers is not equal to the cardinality of all real numbers. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence. In other words, different sides of infinities existed. But you got a lot of backlash for this. It was very controversial. Um, even significant opposition at the time from his colleagues. It was sacrilegious. It was, it was just un no one ever said this before. How, how dare he? But he maintained his assertions and he actually expanded his work. So Dr. Cantor believed that since different sides of infinities existed, they had to be identified. Um, he labeled the first set as Aleph zero, uh, which refers to having the set of, uh, refers to a set of having the cardinality of the smallest countable infinite number. Um, again, on the right over here, this is actually the Hebrew symbol for Aleph that he chose to use to represent this. And furthermore, Aleph one refers to the smallest uncountable infinite set, which is infinitely larger than Aleph zero. After this, Aleph continued to increase. So since he created this new um, uh, term Aleph, he actually gave them their own properties. And you know, this is what he calibrated, what he came up with. And you can just see some examples here. So they had their own unique um, properties. So with Aleph's are omegas. If Aleph zero refers to the cardinality, which is the set of the size of numbers, as in how many of the smallest infinite set, then omega as a number refers to the ordinality or sequential order in which Aleph zero is positioned relative to other Alephs. So like Alice, he gave them their own properties. Um, again, these are unique to this. And here's just some examples, but, but what is the point of this? Um, the properties given to Alephs and omegas are the result of Professor Cantor's interpretation of his transfinite number system that he established. While these properties are not mathematically absolute, they are true relative to his system. Um, for example, there are other mathematical systems, which include infinities, such as hyperreals or surreal number systems, that have fundamentally different properties as compared to Professor Cantor's. But what's mathematically important in all systems is that these systems should be in a relative agreement regarding mathematical truth. So everything we've done so far has just been kind of a history lesson recap of his work. So this is actually something new. Um, we're going to use this new word we're going to call omnifinites. And the prefix omni means all and originates from the Latin word meaning omni, meaning every, all, the whole, every kind. So we're going to use this um, as a new number system. And this is going to refer to this number system, a full collection of all finite and infinite numbers that are complex and non-complex. So with the new uh, number system, we have to come up with a number line. Um, 
I'm going to take it back though first. What we already know is that by definition, a real number is specifically a finite number that is non-complex. Oftentimes, these real numbers are expected graphically on a solid line, such as this number line. But actually, this isn't very accurate. You see, there are infinite infinitesimal numbers in the vicinity of every um, real number on this number line. Thus, the number of infinitesimals is largely greater than the number of reals. The number line below, or the number line should be a dashed line with solids regions corresponding to the real numbers as shown below. Um, so we're going to propose a new number line, which is more accurate and reflective um, and true for a number line. And this is the omnifinite number line. Um, the omnifinites, again, include all numbers and therefore can truly be represented by a solid line as all points in the line represent a distinct and unique omnifinite. Uh, I'm going to note that this symbol here is null zero. And so you can actually see this new um, number system shown below. And so starting here, we have null zero. On either side, we have these different unique size zeros, which represent the infinitesimals close to zero on either side of null zero. Um, and then as you go out, you can see this is a non-complex number line. So you can see one, two, three, four, um, infinity, et cetera. Also want to note that this symbol here, we're going to use to demonstrate as well as on this one, um, absolute infinity. And so um, you can actually, since we have a, with the omni, not, omni finite number system, we, we truly can use a solid line because it represents all numbers. So to represent infinities, this hyperreal and surreal number systems use the term omega, and their infinitesimals are the inverse of those numbers, such that epsilon equals one over omega. But to represent infinities in our system, we're going to use the term originally proposed by John Wells in 1655, Lemnis Cape. It's basically this sideways figure eight, um, as we, most of us have seen before. Um, however, infinitesimals in this system are calibrated differently than for hyperreals and surreals. For omnifinite, the number zero is not a finite number. Zero is a non-finite number that is actually an infinitesimal such that zero equals one over infinity. And so one of the remarkable features of omnifinites is that the numerical system in itself is closer to mathematical truth than other systems, again, such as hyperreals or surreals, since the system is more consistent with observations made in nature using science such as physics. So here are some examples of omnifinites compared to Professor Cantor's Alice and Ordinals. You can see our number system has terms not available in these other systems. So what makes our number system closer to mathematical truth than all others is a fundamental uh, treatment of zero again. But in addition, in most number systems, there's no numerical opposite of zero. Um, sometimes infinity is you know, said and used like a number which is integrating from zero to infinity. However, infinity is not classified as a number in mathematics. It is a concept. So to say that one side of the number system exists and is well-defined properties at zero, but the other side is a concept with some limiting properties, kind of creates a general misunderstanding and inconsistency. So we're going to, so again, I want to reiterate the point that omnifinites have different size infinities and zeros. So based on Professor Kanner's work, there are an infinite number of different differing infinities, and therefore there must also be an infinite number of different size zeros. The omnifinites, we're taking this further. Uh, and again, we're going to say that uh, there's an infinite number of unique and different size zeros and infinities, which are just represented in this table here below. Um, so now that we've kind of talked about what omnifinites are, I want to discuss its properties. Um, they have many properties, including the uniqueness, which have been discussed. But we're going to let's examine other properties, such as the associative, communicative, and distributive properties of omnifinites in comparison to just finites. In the upcoming tables, many of the numbers shall have parentheses around the number to denote one single number. For example, the number 2 plus 6 imaginary plus 3 infinity imaginary is going to be shown as the same thing, but with just parentheses. And of course, we're just doing this for the sake of order of operations. So let's first talk about the associative property of omnifinites. Um, just a reminder, associative property, which means any way in which you group numbers, um, and you, they're still going to get the same result if you multiply them. Um, there's two components here, addition and multiplication. And the tables below show examples of this property applied to finites and omnifinites. So you can see that um, our omnifinites, just like finites, um, we're just adding like terms. We're treating these different symbols almost like their own separate variables. And with the multiplication, we're basically just using FOIL method, the same as we would with finites. So next is the commutative property. Um, and again, another reminder, community properties, no matter which way you multiply terms, um, you're gonna get the same result. And like the associative property, there's two components, addition and multiplication. So again, here's some more tables showing how this property is used. Again, I just wanna reiterate the same, it's, it's very similar to finites where, um, 
or just adding like terms and essentially using flow method. So here's the distributed property of omnifinites. Like the two properties before, the distributed property relates addition and multiplication of numbers. However, this property is often just referred to as the distributed property of multiplication. Um, the property states that the sum of a group of numbers may be multiplied by another number, but the total is equal to the sum of each add end multiplied separately by that other number. Essentially, we're just distributing. And we're gonna treat this similarly to we do uh, with finites. So now I wanna talk about the identity and unity properties. Um, these properties shall connect all numbers to each other as required by numerical mathematics. Um, the table below shows examples of the identity property of addition and, oh, sorry, of addition and um, multiplication of omnifinites in comparison to just finites. In general, for omnifinites, zero is equal to one over infinity. So the identity property will only be true for the smallest of zeros, which is null zero. Um, so you can he see here in this table, we're adding zero, or in our case, null zero, we're getting the same thing. Just like if we times it by one, same thing, we're, it's gonna stay the same. Um, and the unity property follows actually Almquist's law of number unity, which states that any number multiplied by its inverse or divided by itself is equal to unity. Um, Palmquist's law of number unity is true of all numbers, including finites and non-finites alike, as well as absolute infinities, as well as null zero. Um, and this table below shows examples of the unity property for these types of numbers. So if we multiply by the inverse of itself, we're still getting one. Um, here are a couple more additional properties you can see below, including the additive zero identity property. Also, I wanna mention that on the left, of course, is finites and on the right is only finites. But, so we also have the additive inverse nullity, multiplicative unity identity, multiplicative inverse unity, and the nullity power unity. Um, so it's important to note that absolute infinities are important numbers in mathematics. They are infinity above and below all their infinities. There's just no greater lower number than absolute infinities, no lower or higher than absolute infinities. And this table below shows some of the properties of absolute infinities. So if we want to take a look at this. And as shown above, absolute infinities are the same five properties, share the same five properties as mentioned in the previous two tables for finites and omnifinites. However, absolute infinities also possess at least two properties not shared by finites or other omnifinites. These two properties are the additive self-identity property and the multiplicative self-magnitude identity property in here. Um, so in summary, the complete number system referred to as omnifinites was introduced. Omnifinites include all finites, which are real and complex numbers, and non-finites, which are non-complex and complex infinitesimals and infinities. Omnifinites are were or compared to the number system proposed by Professor Cantor, who is the father of set theory and developed Alice and Omegas. And while omnifinites appear similar to the other number systems, the fundamental difference between omnifinites and other systems is the treatment of zero, as well as a lack of an absolute infinity. For example, again, hyperreals and serial number systems only have one number for zero. This is not true for omnifinites. And omnifinites have an infinite number of unique and different size zero. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'd also like to thank um, uh, WKU Boyce D, D Tate uh, professorship for the funding of this research. And does anybody have any questions? Hey, Brian, can you kind of explain, you know, when you say that these omnifinites in theory are closer to mathematical truth than, than other number systems, what's your thinking on that? Why, why are you necessarily supporting that or stating that, if you will? So um, a, a good example for this is in terms of physics, um, Example, if you were trying to heat a temperature of an object to zero, absolute zero, well, that's, you can get it close, but you can't really get it. There are, there are different levels of zero. It's almost impossible to get it to a true zero. Um, so this represents that by having different um, uh, size zeros is because in the past, um, we kind of just um, group things together. And so this really makes a distinction between that. Also, another example would be a vacuum. In real life, it's nearly impossible to reach a true vacuum, which is why there should be different levels of it, or in this case, different levels of zero. If that makes sense. On your uh, slide about associativity, you had a product of uh, infinity one times infinity two. Uh, how, how do you multiply infinities? Or is, is there an algorithm for that? Or what do you know about that? Are you from just down here? Yeah, this is an infinity one times infinity two. Yeah, so we were treating each infinity um, essentially like just its own variable. 
Um, so infinity one and infinity two are separate. So we actually cannot combine those like terms. So we have, um, so like for so example- That's kind of a play on Cantor's system. You know how, you know how Cantor has um, essentially LF zero and then LF one. Um, we had we had kind of mirrored the landscape numbers the same. So basically, um, landscape, if you will, sub two is infinitely larger than landscape sub one, if you will. So 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 ba basically, basically these omniphonites very much mirror in a way um, ordinals in a sense because also ordinals can have subscripts. So we can say, um, what is it? Uh, omega sub zero, um, and then of course, omega uh, sub one and, and so forth to correspond to different orders of LFs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, so it seems like uh, to, to a certain extent, you're extending the algebraic structure of the natural numbers to the infinite numbers. Right. So the way you can kind of multiply things and perhaps even have in inverses. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'm kind of curious if, if you don't mind me asking. I mean, lit literally, we're kind of calibrating the system. And, and, and literally, we're saying that zero, and we're forcing this calibration. We're saying zero is equal to one divided by infinity. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And, and then, so some of you might say, well, you know, uh, and in fact, Brian, go back to that figure, go back to that figure where we show an infinite number, where we saw that picture of, yes, that one right there. See, see on this figure how we've got different sized infinities? It, it, and that really comes from Cantor's work, you know, those, those differing infinities. So, you know, uh, LF0, LF1, LF2, and so forth. Um, the different sized and zeros, kind of what we're thinking is, is look, if there's an, in, if we agree that there's an infinite number of unique and increasing infinities. If we agree to that, then possibly there should be an infinite number of unique and in some ways corresponding zeros as well. So, so with the omnifinites, how we were trying to create that, that um, uh, was basically to say zero is one over infinity and then and, and then a smaller infinity would be zero uh, point zero, and that would be one divided by ten infinity. And so then, as the zeros got smaller, so if you did zero point zero zero, that would be one over a hundred infinity oh. type thing. So that's how we're kind of creating this it's, this it's potential an so infinite number of zeros. Almost kind of like a formalism where you're just kind of you're kind of saying uh, let this 0.0, .0 be the formal inverse of this infinity. Uh, and then you kind of create a structure like that. It's a little bit, you know, they, they, mathematicians do this a lot. They did this with calculus with infinitesimals, you know, kind of take, take, taking like a DX type of thing uh, alone. Um, I mean, you, you, you know, you, at a certain point, you want to make it rigorous and define it in a certain way. But, uh, you know, at this stage, it's kind of like a formal inverse of it. And then thereby, thereby you can create uh, a group structure with these things and get properties out of them. So I, I know this is definitely a little strange uh, 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 and I know a, a little out there, um, uh, you know, just in terms of talking about infinities and so forth. Uh, I know even during Cantor's time, it being a little uh, controversial. Oh, well, sure. I mean, there's a, you know, mathematicians do these things kind of a lot, you know, they just talk about uh, things that, that, that don't necessarily seem to have a, a physical manifestation or physical interpretation. But, but uh, as I said, right now, I, I think we just, you just say, do, you're adding these formal inverses and creating a group structure. And then, you know, what happens, you know, this is, as I say, when people started talking about complex numbers the first time, you know, what are you talking about? Square root of negative one, you can't do that, but you can get good answers to it. Uh, you can use them, you can use them to get answers. Um, okay. One of the things that's that sort of sparked all of this from years ago, of course, is the old the whole you know one divided by zero or any number divided by zero is is undefined, mm -hmm. and it, it, to be very upfront, very honest about it, I, I never really 
liked nor accepted that kind of answer. And I know it's something that we've always learned and we always teach. And, 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 and so, you know, about a year ago, or, you know, I really kind of started to dig into that significantly as, as much as I could anyways, as a engineer. And um, basically what I sort of came up with, and, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but if you have a finite number system, so if we have zero, one, two, three, and then that, you know, and, and it's finite system, you know, basically infinity is a concept. So infinity is technically not a real number. It's a, it's a concept. So, so basically if you block out the non-finites and we just have a finite number system that we're working with, well, if you divide one by zero, I'm in full agreement that there's no other finite number in existence that matches that, that equals that. So, so, so I think from that perspective, it makes perfect sense to say it's undefined because it is. But, but my question is, is if we actually do include all uh, non-finites, so your infinitesimals and your infinities, um, kind of my thinking is, or, you know, in, 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 in my research with my students is that, you know, one divided by zero, you know, is just an infinite quantity. And, and so you, to me, I don't see what's wrong to say one divided by zero is infinity. And, and, and someone say, well, what, what's two divided by infinity or three? I would say three divided by infinity is three infinities. Okay, literally three times infinity. Um, so I, I, again, I'm just kind of putting this out there. Uh, I, I know it's controversial. I'm happy to. <laughs> uh, uh, Alan, you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, in, you, in your talk, you said that um, zero, was, zero is not considered as a finite number. And you also mentioned that um, there are infinitely, infinitely many um, different size zeros. So what if I were to say, what is like one zero divided by another zero with a um, different size? What would that mm -hmm. be? Uh, and, and, and you could, you could do that. So, so you, you, you would take zero, okay? And, and, the, and what you would do to, to, for this quote, quote math to work out, if you will, and that's not the best way to put it, but I would immediately go in and any zero, I would change to its infinitesimal form. So if you write the word zero divided by any number, I would immediately write, I would take zero off and I would put one divided by infinity. And then I would divide that by any number that you're trying to divide by. So let's say for example, you wanna do zero divided by 0, 0.0, okay? So in my book, again, zero divided by point, uh, zero divided by 0, 0.0. So to me, you're taking a zero and you're dividing it by an even smaller zero. And, and so I would write one over infinity divided by one over 10 infinity. So when you do that, that comes out to be 10 because the infinities cancel out, the ones cancel out. The only thing you have left over is, is the 10. And, and again, I know this is controversial where we're, again, we're treating zero you know, basically what we're, we're saying, look, zero is an infinitesimal. Um, and, and there's certainly lots of room for debate on that, but um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Is, is it Dr. Lin or? Um, it's just Alan. Uh, Give him a little more time. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, um, I, I, also, I also have another question to build, build off of that, if that's okay. So I'm, I'm wondering how calculus would be um, affected using this new number system, because calculus is based off of um, inf infinitesimals. So how would that work? My, my, my hope is, and again, I don't have any, everything worked out by any means, uh, but, but my hope is, is that this would apply uniformly straight across the board. So if you wanna integrate, you know, for instance, if you wanna do an integration, from 0 0.00 to four, or you wanna integrate from 0 0.00 to 4.0, that means something. So, so the, the one thing about these omnifinites is this, every number is unique no matter what. There's, there's uh, you know, I know right now we say that, hey, 0.9 repeating is the same thing as one. Um, you're going to kind of see in the next next presentation with my next student that 
you know, basically we say, you know, we understand they're close, they're very similar, but in my view, I would say, look, between 0.99 repeating and one, there's still an infinite number of infinitesimal numbers between them. So to me, to me, the, the big thing is, is number uniqueness, that every number on the number line system has truly, has, has got to be unique. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. And um, thank you. Thank you. And uh, there's just a three minutes to our next talk. And uh, give yourself a brief little break and we'll begin with the next talk.